Let's take a little time for questions. So if some of you, uh, if you have questions in writing, if you just bring them up right now, I'll start answering them. If you want to ask questions over last night, the oneness of God, the identity of Jesus Christ, the almighty God revealed in Jesus, or over tonight, faith, obedience, repentance, baptism, the Holy Ghost. Uh, if you might have a question over specific scripture, how to explain a certain verse. Uh, you might have a question not so much for yourself, but how to explain it to other people. So, uh, you know, what, whatever your question might be, if there are no questions, I'm going to keep teaching. But if there are questions, bring them on up and I'll start answering them. Or if you want a designated person to help collect them, however you want to do that. But we've got a little time, so let's, uh, let's take some questions. All right, the first question is, and you can keep bringing the questions up. Uh, the first question is, how do you explain John chapter 20, verse 22? So I suppose we need to look there first. When it talks about Jesus breathing on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. So let's read it. John chapter 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, this is a command and a prophecy. They did not receive the Holy Ghost at that moment. And I can prove that by the Gospel of John. I already quoted to you John 7, 39. The Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Also in the Gospel of John, in, uh, he explains in uh, chapter, let's see, uh, 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So some people say that when he breathed on them, right that moment they received the Holy Spirit. But that can't be true because John himself has recorded that the Holy Spirit would not come until Jesus was glorified, which is talking about his resurrection and ascension into heaven. And in chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus himself says, I, uh, the Comforter will not come until I go away. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. So in other words, I will be leaving you physically. I will send back my spirit. After I'm gone, I will send back my spirit in your hearts. So when Jesus breathed on him, that, then that was a command of prophecy. He would, and in Greek, also in Hebrew, the word for breath, and wind and spirit is all the same. In Greek, it's pneuma. You know, from that word in English, we get um, pneumatic, pneumonia, you know, all these words dealing with air. And so it determines, the context determines which one is meant. So when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost, that was a command. In other words, I want you to receive the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2 is when they actually received the Holy Ghost. And they heard that sound of a wind. Not only did they remember what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, which I quoted you about the wind blowing, but they remembered this command right here where he breathed on them. And then they realized when Jesus breathed on us, he was giving us a sign. And now we hear that wind, the breath of God, it's our time to receive. So my answer is John chapter 20 and verse 22 is commanding the disciples. They didn't actually receive it until the day of Pentecost. Next question. Uh, is different doctrinal views, oneness versus Trinity, very crucial to our faith in Jesus Christ? Does it matter or make a difference? And I will say yes. If you were here last night, I spent the first 30 minutes explaining that that is our foundation. 
What we believe about the oneness of God is the very foundation. And so, yes, it makes a difference. Um, Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, says that God is interested in only two important questions for us. What do you do with my son Jesus, and what did you do with the talents I gave you? What is your view about Rick Warren's comment? Well, I suppose in a general sense that's true, but the first question, what did you do with my son Jesus, I mean, what do you do with Jesus, is uh, certainly involves who he is. You've got to confess who he is. Of course, I wouldn't view these questions as namely uh, as authority. I would probably phrase them differently. I would probably start with... Uh, you know, did you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, because that's the scriptural terminology. Did you believe and obey the gospel? Uh, and and that's what I would say. Uh, that we've got to start with who Jesus is because that determines everything else. And then the question, who raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. And, of course, um, the Bible speaks of, says God raised him from the dead, says the Spirit raised him from the dead, and Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking of the temple of his body, and that's in John chapter 2. So Jesus raised himself from the dead. In uh, John chapter 2, in verse 19 through 21, Jesus raised himself from the dead. So when you're... When you're uh, looking at this question, when you're thinking of Jesus as a true human being, remember I said last night that Jesus was a true human being in every way except for sin. So everything we can say about ourselves as a human, Jesus had to be able to say about himself as a human. So I'm going to die one day, and I will await the resurrection. Who's going to raise me from the dead? God, right? So Jesus, if I can say that about myself, Jesus as a human had to be able to say that about himself or we can say that about him. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God did. But remember, that Spirit of God dwelt in him. It wasn't external to him, but the Spirit of God that dwelt in him during his life raised him from the dead. The Spirit of God came back to that lifeless body. So therefore, Jesus could honestly say, I'll raise myself up because the Spirit of God in him would raise him up. Okay. Um, whose instructions should one obey or follow to be correctly baptized? Okay, oh, I see. Um, Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So the question is, whose instructions we should, should we follow? And the answer is both of them. Because you can't choose one or the other. Because both of these statements are in the Bible, the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. If you say one is right and one is wrong, you're saying the Bible contradicts itself. And you're not choosing Jesus over Peter because Jesus did not write the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew did. So you're choosing Matthew over the author of Acts, who is Luke. So who are you going to choose? If the apostles were contradicting each other, we can't trust anybody. Now think about it. The instructions of Matthew. Matthew, uh, in Matthew 28 and 19, Jesus was speaking to the apostles. Matthew and Peter were both there. They heard the same thing. Then on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached, remember, Matthew was standing up there with Peter saying, Amen, Amen. You know, in verse 37, the question was, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So the question was not just to Peter, the question was to Matthew as well. And if Peter got it wrong, Matthew should have pulled on his robe and said, Wait, Peter, you got it wrong. You forgot what Jesus said. So the point is, both Matthew and Peter thought that they were fulfilling Christ's command. Now, um, let me take a little, little more time because here's another question on the same, uh, the same passage, Matthew 28. So let me take a look at this. Let's go to Matthew 28 and see how we should understand this. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, when you're going to, to try to understand a passage of Scripture, there are several things you look at. And one thing is you look at the context, the surrounding passages. Now, let me give you two versions, and you tell me which one fits the context. Jesus is saying, I have all power. Go ye therefore. Remember what it's there for. He's saying, because I have all power, therefore I'm sending you out. I want you to make disciples unto me. I want you to teach them all of my commandments, and I will be with you always to help you fulfill this. So since I have all power, you're making disciples unto me, you're teaching them my commandments, I'm going to be the one working with you, then therefore I want you to baptize in the name of three different persons. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Now let me give you the other way. I have all power, therefore I'm sending you to make disciples unto me, to teach them my commandments. I'll be with you, so baptize in my name. Do you see the context lead you to suppose he's talking about himself and his name. Now, if you look at the grammar, that's another thing that you would that would, you would examine. In verse 19, it says, in the name, singular. So it's not names, plural, as if there were three different persons with three different names, but one name that reveals all of God's work as Father, Son, and Spirit. And we discussed that at great length last night, so I'm not going to repeat that. Also, you look at the background. These disciples that received the words of Jesus, they were Jews, trained from childhood to believe there's only one Lord, one God. They never heard the word Trinity. They never heard the word three persons. These terms were invented around A.D. 200 or later. So when we read Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we have those terms in our brains. But they didn't. What did they have in their brains? Just a few days earlier, Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I will send the Spirit, the Comforter. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So they had in their mind, who is the Father? Who is the Son? Who is the Holy Spirit? So when he made that statement, they understood what he meant. Now, if you look at how it's fulfilled, the book of Acts, they fulfilled it by calling on the name of Jesus. Now, if that's how the apostles understood it and obeyed it, then we should understand it and obey it the same way. The apostles are greater authorities than us. They were actually there. They could ask Jesus questions. They understood what he meant. If they were confused, they could say, Jesus, what did you mean? And he would explain that. So how can we understand it better than the apostles did? If that's how they understood it, that's how we should understand it. If that's how they fulfilled it, that's how we should fulfill it. And in fact, if you look at the parallel passages, I'll, I'll be quick here. The Great Commission, we find it here in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. But this is not the only version. There's also Mark 16, 15 through 20. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils and so on and so on. So in Mark's account, he mentions baptism, but he mentions in my name. That's the name of Jesus. Okay, another account of the Great Commission is in Luke 24, 47 through 49, which says, and repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name. So Matthew says name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mark says my name. Luke says his name. What name fits all three of those accounts? It's the name of Jesus. So I will say, to answer the question, we need to obey the words of Jesus. But how do we obey them? The way the apostles obeyed them in Acts 2.38. It's like if I would send my son to the store and say, I want you to buy something for me, and uh, the owner of the store is my friend, so just tell him your father will pay for it later. So he goes, my son goes to the store, and he says, my father will pay for it. And the store owner says, well, who is your father? He says, you know, father, father. 
No, who is your father? David Bernard. He can't just repeat the words father. He's got to give the name that that represents. And so when we come to baptize, we can't just repeat the words father, son, and spirit. We have to understand, what is that name talking about? That's the name of Jesus. Praise God. All right, I've got to hurry up here or I won't get all these questions done. Okay. All right. Let me take care of the ones that... All right. Um, this one, I think I really answered uh, yesterday, but I will briefly go through it again. How do you explain John 14, 23? John 14, 23... Jesus is saying, if a man love me, he will keep my words. My father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Why did Jesus say we will come? Father and son. It's not talking about two spirits. There's only one spirit. Uh, Ephesians 4, 4, there's only one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. So Jesus is not saying you're going to have two different persons living inside of you. But how is that fulfilled? How does Jesus come inside of us? When we receive the Holy Spirit. But when we receive the Spirit, we receive the Spirit of the Father and the Son. I mentioned yesterday, when we think of God the Father, we think of the source of our life, our Creator, our Sustainer. We're thinking of the God who said, let there be light. And there was a light. We think of the power of God. So if I say you have the spirit of your father in you, we think of the awesome power of God. But that same spirit dwelt in Christ as he walked on earth. And that spirit led him to be obedient and humble and faithful and endure suffering and even death. And we don't think of that in association usually with, with God, but yet when God came in flesh... The flesh was submitted to the Spirit. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we not only receive the power of the Father working in our lives, but we receive the humility and the obedient Spirit of the Son in our lives. We receive both Father and Son, but not as two spirits, as one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. In other words, we receive the total work of God, including what he did in the incarnation. And that's the way that we can understand this. All right. Um, question. Do the Jews use the concept of compound unit for Echad in the Shema? Okay, let me explain that. The Shema is Deuteronomy 6.4, the confession of faith of the Jews. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, what some people say when it says one Lord... The word one is from the Hebrew echad. And they say, well, that means a compound unity. Well, I would say that's true in English as well. You have to look at the context to determine the exact meaning. Like the English word one. It can mean numerically one, numerical oneness. We count one, two, three. If I say there's one person sitting there, that's a numerical oneness. But if I say my friend and I are one, or my wife and I are one. That's in a sense of unity. So the meaning of the word one can change depending on the context. Well, that's true in Hebrew as well. So what you have to ask is in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and these other passages that speak of one God, what is the context? Is it trying to say there's only one God in contrast to what the pagans believe? Or is it saying the council of gods are united? Well, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, Jehovah our God, is one. In the context, he's trying to establish worship of the true God in opposition to all the false gods. So he's speaking of numerical oneness. If he's not speaking of numerical oneness, then it destroys the whole point. If he's saying the true God is a compound unity, you can say, oh, well, we can worship Baal too then. Just stick him in the compound unity. Oh, we can worship all these other gods as long as we put them in the union. union. So that wouldn't, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't establish a worship of Jehovah against all the other gods. 
So when you look at the context of Isaiah, remember I spent all that time. God says, I'm alone, by myself, none like me, none beside me. What is that saying? More than unity, it's saying oneness. So when you look at the context, it's very clear that in this context, it's God's absolute oneness. Uh, John 14, 20. Why did Jesus make this comparison uh, as the Father and Jesus, his believers in him? Okay, let's read John 14, 20. And at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Well, it's talking about union with believers. And I think this is, since Jesus is making the comparison with us, this is not speaking of the incarnation. This is speaking of our us as humans being in union with God. Now, when Jesus says the Father is in me, in, in earlier in the chapter, he is speaking of his identity as God manifests in the flesh because he says if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So that indicates identity. But later on in the chapter, he has broadened it to talk about us and our relationship with God. And obviously he's not trying to say that we are God or that we are the incarnation of God. Nobody would believe that that's a, a Christian, whether it's Trinitarian or not a Trinitarian. So when he says, I will be in you, he is speaking of our receiving Christ to dwell in our hearts. And so he says, ye shall know that I am in my Father, ye in me, and I in you. And here he's speaking more in terms, he as a human has the closest possible relationship with God. And he is saying, we also can have that same relationship through him as humans can be related to God. So what we have to understand, remember I told you, everything that Jesus can say about himself as a human, we have to be able to say about ourselves as a human, or, or everything that we can say about ourselves as human, Jesus had to be able to say that. So if we can envision ourselves as being united with God and God's Spirit dwelling in us, then Jesus had to be able to speak of that same thing himself. So here's an example of he's saying, just as I, as a human, can have the closest possible fellowship with God and obey God and be surrendered to God and God work in my life, so you can have that same relationship through me. As he's talking about a human relationship. Okay, another question, why isn't the title Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit commonly used in the Old Testament? Doesn't ghost refer to the spirit of a departed person? And it is more appropriate to use the term Holy Ghost after the death of Christ. Well, in, in the Bible, uh, where you see in the King James Version, Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, the term ghost and spirit are English words. They translate the same Greek word, pneuma. It's no difference. And so actually your modern translations would use spirit because it's not talking about um, the spirit of a, a departed person. It's just talking about spirit in general. There are a few places in the King James Version that say Holy Spirit. But most of the time, um, in, in the New Testament, whether it's Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, it's the same word, pneuma. So you can't really make a doctrinal difference. Um, either term is appropriate, but for modern English, the term spirit is more understandable. I don't think you should make a, dis a distinction in that regard. Okay. Um, how do you explain 1 John 5, 7 through 8 to a Trinitarian believer? Let's look at 1 John 5, 7 through 8. By the way, this is not in the modern translations because they say this was added later. It's not part of the original text. But let's, let's look at it as it is written. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Well, as I mentioned last night, you can know me in different ways. You can know me in a personal relationship. So my children know me as father. My students know me as teacher. Teacher. 
Right? You can know me by my word. You can hear my word. You can read my books. You know me by my word. You can know me by my spirit. If we visit together and have fellowship, go out to dinner, you can feel my spirit. If we pray together, you can discern what kind of spirit that I have. But is my word a different person from me? Is my spirit a different person from me? No. These are different ways of knowing me. But the same, I'm the same person. And my name is David Bernard. And when you say the name David Bernard, you are covering everything about me. The same way with God. God has revealed himself as Father. God has revealed himself by his word. And God has revealed himself by his spirit. But these are just different ways that God works in our world. They're not three different personal beings. And the one name of Jesus Christ reveals God in all of his fullness. And that's why this scripture says these three are one. Now, the next verse talks about the spirit and water and the blood working together. These three agree in one. So if you, if you think Father, Word, and Spirit would be three different persons, you would think that also would say agree in one. But it doesn't say agree in one. It says are one. This is the only verse that uses the word three in relationship to God. I gave you many scriptures last night that use the word one in relationship to God. Over 50 verses use the term holy one. But there is only this one verse, and it says these three are one. So the emphasis is on um, the oneness of God. Okay, let me move, move on here. If the oneness doctrine is so obvious, simple, and important in the Bible, why uh, doesn't so many theologians, Trinitarians, who have studied the Bible in detail for so many years not see it? Or why do they choose not to believe it or emphasize it? Well, um, I guess you'd have to ask them. <laughs> but I think uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 gives one reason. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, uh, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. One problem is people study this subject through the terms of Greek philosophy. And it's what I was mentioning last night. When you read the word God, for example, what definition do you bring to the text? What we should do is start with the Old Testament definition and bring that definition to the New Testament text. But what most people do is they start with the 4th century, 5th century definitions of the creeds, and every time they read God or Father or Son or Spirit, they already have in their mind what that means. And so, But they're approaching it from terms derived from Greek philosophy. You see, Greek philosophy said God is high, remote, cannot be touched, cannot feel, does not have emotions, cannot get his hands dirty, so to speak. And so the true God could not really interact with this sinful world. And so God had to send something out of himself as a second person. And that's who could interact with this world. And that's really how this concept of the word being a different person from God, how it started. From the Greek philosophical concept that God is remote and, and unapproachable, impassable, meaning cannot be touched or cannot feel cannot have emotions. If you study Plato and, and the Neoplatonists, you will see that. You study the Gnostics, you'll see this concept. God cannot be moved, cannot be touched. But that's not the Hebrew concept of God. If you read the Old Testament, God is grieved. God is angry. God is, is jealous. God, uh, you know, God gets excited when His people do good, and He gets angry when His people do bad. God is very much involved in His creation. So he doesn't have to send someone else to interact with his creation. He interacts with his creation himself. So if you start with the philosophical concept, that's why people that are very sincere, but they've already got their glasses on, just like if you read with, with uh, sunglasses on, you're going to see it differently no matter how carefully you read. It's going to be colored. Well, that's, that's philosophy and tradition. Another reason is tradition. It's been handed down and they don't want to buck the tradition. Some people see it, but they won't say anything. And I've got in some of my books records prominent Baptist theologians and others 
who a prominent pres, uh, Presbyterian minister of 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and on and on and on, that actually have come to the same kind of conclusion. But, and some will state it, for everyone that states it, probably 10 don't because they're afraid of the consequences or they don't even want to investigate further. I was, uh, earlier this year, I had a discussion with a professor of theology in uh, Michigan, you know, the United States, and he qu made this quote. It's a famous quote. He said, well, if you try to understand the Trinity, you're in danger of losing your mind. <laughs> but if you try to deny the Trinity, you're in danger of losing your soul. Well, if that's your philosophy, what are you going to do? I don't want to talk about it. Stay away from it. If I deny it, I might be lost. And I can't understand anyway, so I'm not going to try. I'm going to leave that alone. So a lot of people do that. Well, I, I better just believe it. And what happens, you find uh, in church history, and even today, people say, yes, I believe in the Trinity. But if you ask, what do you mean by the word Trinity? What do you mean by Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? A lot of them would say something very similar to what I'm saying. But as long as they just say, oh, I believe in the Trinity, then everybody leaves them alone. Doesn't ask any questions. So a lot of people do believe what we believe, but either they never heard it explained or they don't want to discuss it with anybody for fear of stirring controversy. And so a, a lot of times it's just not talked about. But there are more and more people coming to a full understanding in our day. So uh, another reason is, you know, 1 Corinthians 2, it says the carnal mind... Uh, cannot understand the things of God. They're spiritually discerned. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's hard to understand some things. But the Spirit opens your understanding. Well, that's at least a partial explanation. Um, let me see. How would you explain Revelation 1, 5 through 6? It's talking about Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the Prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. This is a good example. Jesus was a true human being. So everything we can say about ourselves in relationship to God, Jesus had to be able to say about himself in relationship to God. So is it surprising when Jesus says unto, speaks unto God and his Father? No. Because we would say that of ourselves, right? And so in this passage, um, Jesus is making us kings and priests. He had to do it first for us. In other words, Jesus lived a sinless life, and he won the right to be king and priest by his own sinless life. Well, everything he won for himself we can receive by believing on him. See, Jesus was the heir of Abraham. He inherited all the promises God gave to Abraham. He was the heir of David. He inherited all the promises God gave to David. And when we believe on him, we share in those promises. So Jesus, as a human, he earned the right to be king and priest because he lived a sinless life. He obeyed God. Everything that Adam didn't do, Jesus did. So everything he won for himself as a true human who did not sin, who conquered the devil, then we inherit because of him. So we become kings and priests not because of our own merit, but by what Jesus did. So he is putting himself, first of all, in that human place of saying, I have obeyed God. I have served God. I have fulfilled uh, everything God commanded. And therefore, I become a king and priest unto God. Now, you can become kings and priests with me by stepping into the position of faith. And so in that passage, it's describing everything Jesus won as a true human. So it speaks of God and his Father, just as we would speak of our God and Father. Now, this is a good example of Jesus um, as a true human being. All right, Acts 2.38, Peter said, You shall receive the gift 
of the Holy Ghost. And the questions are, uh, how do you explain, is this more than the gift of tongues, as Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians? Is there any thing to justify this besides the reference in Acts when there was not an interpreter. Well, what we have to understand, the gift of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, that's a different Greek word, by the way, in 1 Corinthians, doron, whereas in, in uh, 1 Corinthians it's talking about charismata. There is the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit come to dwell in you. And then once God's Spirit is working in you, there are many gifts that come out of that. There is healing, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. So there is a difference even in the Greek language. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit dwelling in you. The various gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 are gifts of the Spirit working in your life. Now, you can see the difference. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 talks about the use of tongues in the life of the church. And he says, if someone speaks in public worship in tongues, you pray for an interpreter. If there's no interpreter, he should keep silent. And uh, there should be at most two or three uh, messages in tongues and interpretation. The reason for that is, is to keep order in the service, the public worship, so that everything is for the benefit of all. But if there is no interpreter, you can keep silent and he speaks to himself and to the Lord. So in your personal prayer, your personal worship, you can speak in tongues because it's a benefit to you. So when we're all praising God together, if everybody wants to speak in tongues individually to themselves and to God, that's in order. Because you're not, uh, you're not speaking to the whole congregation, you're just speaking to yourself and to God. But when you have the attention of the whole congregation, it needs to be a prophecy in the known language or it needs to be a tongues and an interpretation. So he's explaining this. But in Acts, 120 received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. They did not wait for an interpreter because they were talking about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that shows you that tongues is an initial sign of people when they receive the Holy Ghost. And then later, they continue to speak in tongues in their personal prayer life. And they can sometimes speak in tongues for the public service. But in that case, they must follow the rules of 1 Corinthians. Um, you don't see those rules in Acts because it's not talking about the gift of tongues in the life of the church in public worship services. It's talking about um, the initial uh, reception of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56. Let's take a look at this. This is a... A good one. This is when Stephen was stoned in Acts 7, 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. What did Stephen see? He did not see two persons. He saw one person. He saw Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. Now, let me explain. The term right hand is symbolic of power. It is not literal. He did not see two bodies. Now, I'll tell you why. John 4, 21, 4, God is a spirit. You cannot see a spirit. Where's the right hand of, a, of the spirit of God? God's spirit is everywhere. Uh, John 1.18, this was written long after the events of Acts. John 1.18 says, no man has seen God at any time. So it would be a mistake to interpret this as Stephen saw a separate person of God. He saw Jesus. You can, you can, uh, it's obvious in um, verse 59, they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus Receive my spirit. If he saw two persons, he ignored one of them. And he only spoke to Jesus. And then the next question is, if there's a trinity, why didn't he see three persons? Why did he see only two? So it's not, it's not talking about a trinity. It's not talking about seeing God as a separate person from Jesus. It's talking about Jesus seeing Jesus in the position of power. Now in Hebrew, in Greek, and also in English, 
when you say the right hand, it's symbolic of power because for most people, they're right-handed. And uh, if, you're, if you are right-handed and you try to work with your left hand, you see how awkward it is. Your right hand signifies your power, your strength, your ability. Well, we find this in the Bible. Uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 6. Thy right hand, O God, is glorious in power. It's talking about when he delivered um, Israel from Egypt. Is it saying that a big hand came out of heaven and pulled him out? He had his left hand tied behind his back and he used his right hand? No, it's talking about the power of God. Here's another good example. At the trial of Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, 64, Jesus said to the high priest, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man coming at, in the clouds at the right hand of power. Now when Jesus comes back, are we going to see two persons in the clouds? No, we're going to see one person, but we're going to see him in the position of power. When Jesus walked on earth, he looked like an ordinary man. To the eyes of faith, they could know who he was, but to the average person, he just looked like another man. In fact, at the Last Supper, John who was his close friend, he leaned up against his breast at supper, talked to him very personally and closely. But that same John in Revelation chapter 1, when he saw the glorified Christ in his power, what happened? He fell down at his feet as dead. It's the same John, the same Jesus. What's the difference? He saw him in the position of power, not just as an ordinary man, but as God manifest in the flesh, the glory of God. So... What Stephen is saying, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He's saying, I see Jesus in the position of power. I see him with glory and power and majesty. And that's why he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He prays to this one who has all power. And so he saw, I believe he saw Jesus as the only visible being, but he saw him surrounded by the glory of God in the position of all power. And that matches what we see in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, where there's one throne in heaven, not two thrones, and one sat on the throne. And that matches what we saw in Revelation 22, 3 through 4, the throne of God and of the Lamb, and his servant shall serve him. One throne, not two thrones. So the right hand is not a physical position, but it is a metaphor or a symbol of God's power. And then I have one more question here, Ezekiel 36 and 25, which is talking about um, sprinkling. If I, yeah, 36, 25, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness from your idols will I cleanse you. And he says, I believe in baptism by immersion, but what does it mean here when we talk about sprinkling? Well, this verse is not really talking about baptism as such. What Ezekiel is talking about, he's using the Old Testament rituals where they would sprinkle water, sprinkle blood on a sacrifice or, or something like that. And he's saying, I'm going to do that to you in the New Covenant. It's not a specific to water baptism. It's talking about the work of, of God in cleansing the heart. And he's using this example as a type. Um, a typology. But we know baptism in the New Testament is by immersion for many reasons. Number one, Jesus was immersed in Mark, uh, Matthew 3.16. He came up out of the water. We know that the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, what is it, about verse 36, both he and Philip went down into the water. Uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 4, we're buried with Christ in water baptism. And so obviously it's um, baptism by immersion fulfills the symbol of uh, baptism being a burial with Christ. And so that's the specific teaching of the New Testament that would set the pattern for us when it comes to how we baptize. In fact, the very word baptize is from the Greek baptizo, which literally means to dip to plunge, to immerse. It's one of those words that actually was not translated. It was just copied over into English. If you were going to do a true translation, it would say, be dipped or be immersed in the name of Jesus. But that's one of the words that they chose not to actually translate, but to transliterate, just to carry the word over from Greek into English. Um, because 
of its uh, unique character as a ceremony for Christians. Well, that gives you a brief summary. And there are many more uh, questions that I'm sure that you have. But let me try to summarize it. And if we have some time, I might uh, later, I might give you some pointers of how you can interpret Scripture properly. But if you'll notice, many of these answers, the key is to look at the context, the surrounding verses, to get a full understanding. And another key is to look at parallel or similar passages because all of the Bible is the Word of God. So you interpret Scripture by Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. One passage will shed light on another passage. A clear passage will help you understand a difficult passage. And so as you put it all together, you can get a clear understanding that will be consistent with the whole Word of God. We cannot assume that one verse is going to contradict another verse because then there would be error in the Bible. But we must assume that there is an answer that will fit all the Scriptures together. And so that's what we have to do. Well, let's stand tonight. I hope that I've given you some 